Now you guys are weird. You're weird. You know <laughs> why you're here. <laughs> Actually, if we're not weird, we should be. <laughs> we should be. Supernatural ministry is weird by definition, and in a way, we've seen some evidence of that in that scripture. And there's a bit of that already at, at Christ Church. We see things like gifts of healing, words of knowledge and prophecy, some speaking in tongues. And there's just a few of those kind of supernatural ministries that take place in churches like Christ Church. The biggest problem that believers have is not that supernatural ministries are too weird, although I do think there are lots of Christians who think they are weird. That's far from where they are at the moment. But what's kind of probably a bit more concerning is that we try and make God normal. And God isn't normal. He is otherworldly. He is heavenly. After all, we believe in an invisible God with no beginning, who spoke um, the universe into existence, who lives outside time and space, who is everywhere, knows everything, and can do anything. <coughs> who sent his God-man son into the world, brought him back to life after he was thoroughly killed and then returned him back to heaven, and who resurrects us, who resurrects us too, so we can live forever. That's hardly normal. And the truth is, because we're here, I think most of our friends think we're already weird, okay? We might try and pretend that we're kind of normal, but in reality, we're, we're not. So we need to kind of get over that and stop trying to blend in and get out there trying to do some weird things in Jesus' name. After all, we are called not to conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Then we will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good and pleasing, perfect will. And that's Romans 12, verse 2. So let's talk a bit more about this supernatural ministry that we see in, this, um, in, this, in these verses. Jesus was going about his business, and he was heading towards Jerusalem, and he bumped into ten lepers. Well, he didn't bump into ten lepers, because they had to stand at a distance, because they were unclean physically, and spiritually. Lepers were despised and so loathed that they were not allowed to live in, in any community with their people. They weren't allowed to come within six feet of another person and 150 feet if the wind was blowing. You know, someone's actually thought about that. That's what's quite, quite sad and pitiful, really, isn't it? Um, it kind of makes me think, when I think about lepers and stories like this, there's a bit of Ben-Hur. And I'm talking about the old, you know, Charlton S. Heston uh, Ben-Hur, which I think is an absolutely love, such an awesome film. I haven't seen the latest one. But due to Ben-Hur, you know, he had a mum and, um, and a sister, and they were thrown into prison and sort of forgotten. And then at some point they were rediscovered, and they had, lep they had leprosy. And then they were sort of cast out, and they lived this very shadowy life. And um, it's well worth going back to, it's, there's a lot of theology and some great stuff. And Jesus is in that film as well, so it's good. I'm sure most people have seen it. If you're of a certain age, you've definitely seen it. <laughs> okay, so what's it say in this scripture? Well, they cried out to Jesus and they said, have pity on us. And he did have pity on them. And Jesus healed them. So I just want to pick a couple of points here. That raises, that's been raised in this, um, these verses. You, know, you and me, there are lots of people, and I think there's been echoes of this we've been talking about in prayer this morning and just throughout the service. And it's quite interesting, and this was written about two, three weeks ago, and how things are starting to come together this morning. And it's kind of really affirming and encouraging when we see this in people's prayers and, and when God gives them words of knowledge to speak out in the service. There's a lot of people around us, our friends and family, our neighbors, do you know, they're in need as well, and they need us to have pity, pity on them, but not in this kind of Christian self-righteous way. And I'm not calling for us to be totally overwhelmed by the amount of need that's out there, which there is a lot. 
But we do need to be sensitive to God's will and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And that is why Romans 12, verse 2 is so important, being able to discern God's will. And we do that by living holy lives and having holy minds. We also need to know that Jesus was busy making his way to Jerusalem, but he didn't let his business or his busyness get in the way of blessing others. And this is really kind of a note for myself as much as anyone else. You know, do we let our busyness um, be an excuse for blessing others, spending time with them, listening, perhaps ministering to them? Because I think we can always guarantee when people need help, it's never at the right moment. It's always pretty much going to be inconvenient. Jesus, again, if we, if we look through the Gospels, really turn people away. He was tired. He wanted to spend time with his father. He was going somewhere. And then these kind of occurrences took place. And he just say, I'm too busy now. Get lost. He kind of doesn't do that. And we aren't either. Our supernatural gifts, whether they're healing or words of knowledge and encouragement and hospitality, are practical ways we can bless others and extend God's kingdom here on earth. And that's why verse 15 and 16 is so important. It reads, One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. And he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. It is highly likely that this leper also received salvation because of his healing encounter with Jesus. So our spiritual gifts can be very, very important in aiding people to receive eternal life. And Jimmy's testimony yesterday at the men's breakfast, and he was talking about golf, and um, he went out with a group of people, and there was a chap there who was slightly hostile to him. And what was quite impressive that Jimmy was talking about, you know, he's obviously being sensitive to the Holy Spirit here, and he was trying to think about, you know, what was the, the seed, what was the... And the cause of that, what was the underlying problem? And when the encounter came up again, and he was able to pray, offer prayer for this person. Now that person did not become a Christian at that point, but they are certainly one step closer to eternity than they were when before they met Jimmy. And I think there's loads of occurrences like that in our own lives and offering prayer, and we've talked about that today already, and those little opportunities can transform, or at least be the beginning of transforming people's lives, our friends, our families, and those around us. Okay, let's, let's have a look at some practical ways we can develop our understanding of being supernatural. I'm kind of referring to this book. It's a real pity that it doesn't seem to be available in the UK. This is from uh, Jordan Seng, who was a keynote speaker at New Wine. He was a very important keynote speaker at New Wine uh, this summer. And he did sort of the morning slot. And it doesn't just talk about healing. It talks pretty much about a whole range of different supernatural ministries. I want to keep my eyes open for this when it is kind of fully launched. I think it's about 18 quid second hand on Amazon, which is just ridiculous. It's a supernatural, sorry, it's a down-to-earth supernatural guide to ministries. And I'm kind of making reference to this and his, um, his talks, which I know that a number of people went to. And I would encourage people to think about going to New Wine, okay? Um, you know, if God is, God's not too posh to spend some time in a tent, then I don't think anyone in this room is, can be too posh to spend some time in a tent, or indeed a caravan. One of my friends are about to go, and um, some very, very good friends of mine, and... Um, they're coming to join Christ Church next year at uh, New Wine. It is such a great space and time that you spend time with God. There's ministry. The teaching's really good. There's a great time of fellowship. You will meet God. I can promise you that. And he will speak to your heart because we're spending effectively six days in his presence. And that is an immense amount of time. And you go there. And if you allow the Holy Spirit, you've taken a step of faith for actually going there and trying to slum it slightly. I do encourage you, um, and if you book it before the end of November, you get the discounted rate. Please pray about that. You know, it'll be, it, it is such a good thing. 
Okay, let's get back to supernatural ministries. Okay, um, we, we, we know a bit about this, and Jordan saying kind of really breaks this down, keep it simple. And he goes, starts, you know, find a sick person, and then you lay your hands on them. And in the name of Jesus, you say, be healed. And he says that's pretty much it. And that is pretty much it. We can be fancier and try all sorts of uh, variations. In the name of Jesus, leg be healed. These are for people who have difficulty with mobility. In the name of Jesus, headache be healed. These are for people who have got slight problems in their head. I know it's kind of sounding a bit flippant here. But in reality, it's a bit of, it is a bit of that. Okay, I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. These biblical encounters of healing usually involve the laying on of hands because it's a person-to-person activity. It is you and me giving away the power that God has given us. And our God is, an, is a relational type of God. And so it is fitting that he wants us, me and you, to have relationships with one another and to interact with one another. You know, God especially wants us to work in partnership with him. He worked in partnership with Adam and Eve right at the beginning and to extend their garden and to name things and animals. He is a relationship type of God. He doesn't really want to heal and minister to to people by himself. He could do that. He could just do that and that person could be healed. But how would they know it was from God? So he involves us. He's very gracious and involves us to boost our own faith but also to impact upon other people's lives. We are called to go and minister in his name. And that's what he did, that's what he said, that's what Jesus said to his disciples. So there's a couple of verses I'm just going to kind of pick out here. Matthew 10, you know, Jesus called his 12 disciples with him. And he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. So he gives them authority, gives you and me authority. Mark 16, verses 15 to 19, go into the world and preach the good news to all creation. And he goes on, these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, in the name of Jesus, they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. Okay, that's the basics. But we do need to do a little bit of preparation. So we go out. He gives us authority. He asks us to place hands on people. He says, in, he encourages us to use the name of Jesus to pray for people. But we do need a bit of preparation. And we need that if we're going to try and have blessed with the gifts of prophecy, words of knowledge, encouragement, intercession, and even hospitality. Magna doesn't just rush into the kitchen and, and conduct a really, uh, make a really nice meal. You just have preparation there. You just have to get the ingredients. You just have to think about it. And in a way, the supernatural ministries are, are about the preparation beforehand. Jordan Seng talks about it's more to do with power than technique. And he suggests that the notion of growing in supernatural power is a, is a common, if sometimes subtle, feature of kingdom stories and teaching. For example, when Jesus was baptized, the Spirit descended on him, and he was full of the Holy Spirit. But then the Spirit led him into the wilderness where he fasted, and overcame temptation for 40 days, after which he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And then he began to do miracles. So Jesus was baptized, and the Holy Spirit came upon him. He then went out into the wilderness, spent time with God, fasting, in prayer, reading his scriptures. And then he was given power then to do miracles. Now, just a progression. 
Now, one of my gifts is, you know, I mean, it's quite bizarre that I can teach, really, because it was so spurious, me going into teaching. And uh, it really was, it was probably not the right, I didn't necessarily do it for the right motives. I was thinking, what else can I do? I, I did a, I did a, <laughs> I, I did want to be an accountant, okay, and that's what I was doing at the NHS. I'm from the West Midlands, okay, you might have picked your bits that up. And I um, worked in the NHS, doing a bit of accounts, and then I knew, Joe, this is not for me, but I was really into politics. There's a degree, and I think, what do you do with a degree? I would go and teach, go and teach politics, which I didn't end up teaching politics. Um, but it was all kind of funny how God sort of sometimes takes hold of us, and we might not really know where we where are we going? But, but he kind of does. I wasn't a Christian then. Um, but the point is, if, I can, if I'm any good at teaching, it's because I spend some time in preparation. Yes, we have, I, have, I believe the Spirit gives me giftings, but I have to spend time. I, I've had a long time to chew over this. I mean, um, you know, I was given this passage before uh, the summer holiday, which is all really, really helpful because I can then spend some time and just being open to that. You know, I don't really want to do these words in my own bath because they lack strength. And I think it will be less effective because of that. So every single one of our giftings is very much like that. We'll talk a bit more about that later on, but we need to do some preparation. And Jordan Sank uses this phrase, which we may not like. It's called the power equation. He didn't name it that. It was given to him by somebody else. But he talks about if we want to be effective in our ministries, there's a, there's a kind of like a number of things that come together. One is authority, plus gifting, plus faith, and consecration. And the combination of those, it's not about getting the right ingredients, the right proportions, but they do kind of make sense if we are to be um, effective. I'm just going to spend a few minutes going through some of those. The first one is authority. And authority is about being obedient to Jesus. There's a tough one, isn't it? Obedient to Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we minister to people. And that's why we need to walk in step with him and the Holy Spirit. Now, the more we are obedient to Jesus in our own lives, the more authority we are given. And this becomes quite important because God doesn't want us to heap even more sins upon so if, he kno- if God knows that I'm not going to be obedient, then he won't necessarily tell me to do things. Because if I don't do it, then that's kind of disobedience is a sin. And so the more I'm disobedient, the less God is going to ask of me. He'll get on my case over various things, which he does that to every single one in our room. But it's not really going to be as, we're not going to be as effective. We're not going to be as useful to him. Because, you know, we don't, if he's going to speak to us in the word or in church or from our friends and we're going to really cock a deaf one to that, then we're, then we're kind of heaping more sin on us. So obedience is really important. Disobedience in Jesus in our lives reduces our authority. And there are times, which I know pretty much everyone has had that, I can remember hearing God and it may be that I need to say something to someone or pray for them, and I haven't. And then afterwards you feel wretched, okay? Because you know that Satan is basically laughing at that boy. saying, ah, yeah, good one there. Uh, God does give us second chances, and that's the other thing. When we are disobedient, we need to come back to him. We need to repent and ask for his help to say, help me to be more obedient. The second one is gifting. If we are specifically gifted in a particular area, like healing, although it doesn't have to be healing, that can be hearing discerning words and prophecy. It could be all sorts of spiritual gifts. If it is our gifting, then we'll find it easier. We all, actually, everyone in this room has the gift, or at least can sing, okay? Because I've heard you... Okay, I heard you singing today. And um, yeah, we may not be comfortable standing up here or there and giving a solo. Is that right? (laughs) But you can all sing. Not all of you may want to do a solo. 
if you can, and these guys up here today, you know, did a great job, and I know our worship team have, you know, they have a spiritual gift there. They might not think it's easy, but it's a lot easier than perhaps for some of us. However, I'm not going to let you off the hook here. Just because gifting at healing may not be your number one doesn't mean that you are not to pray healing for people. It is not about that. So I'm sorry about that if you think that. Okay, be like saying, well, I can't sing, therefore I'm not. It'd be kind of absurd. God loves it when we try. And we know that because I, and I, one of the notes I'll talk about later on for home groups is Matthew 25, verse 14, the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents is really important. It is about trying. And it's not about burying our talents. Talents in those days were about money. But I think it's quite an interesting phrase because talents can be can do with gifts and skills and things that we're good at. And you know, we're not called to hide them. You know, sometimes in that, that one, the bad servant, as it were, went unto a lot of effort to bury those talents. Sure, that may have taken a bit more effort to bury it than actually to use it, to invest it. What happened to those who tried? Well, effectively, God is saying, you are a good and faithful servant. And what better praise can we have than our Heavenly Father saying, you're a good and faithful servant. And those guys, those characters, it wasn't about failure. They could have failed. But I don't think the parable is about failure. It's about trying, trying to put some of those things into practice. So let's do some trying. The third one is about faith. And we're called to kind of get our faith on and prepare ourselves and prepare those who we may be praying for. Where there is more faith, power increases. Again, as you go through the, the, the Gospels, just have a look at what Jesus is doing. And again, this was very helpful by people like Jordan saying, we've all read those passages quite a long time. We've seen him heal, heal people. But look how Jesus does it, how he manages the scenario, the, the situation. In Matthew 9, 27, Jesus heals a blind man. Jesus takes him inside the house. Why did he take him in the house? Because it may be where Jesus was, there was a lot of people. There was probably a lot of noise. There's all sorts of faith issues going there. Some people were looking for signs. Some people believed. A lot of people think he was a charlatan. So Jesus takes that person and sort of brings him into the house where he can manage that person's faith. And he asks him, do you believe you can be healed? And the man said, yes, Lord. Was. There are lots of other ones. It's Matthew, sorry, Mark six thirty-five onwards. Jesus got rid of those who were pulling down faith by separating himself from them. Have a look at these scriptures or other types of scenarios that are happening in the, the Bible, in the Gospels. Look what Jesus is doing about managing the faith atmosphere of the person being healed and those around them. Look what he did to the ten lepers. He said, bear in mind, they were kind of outcasts. He said, go and show yourself to the priests. And as they walked, they were healed. So they were kind of exercising faith. Another keynote speaker was talking about ways that we can kind of involve the people that we might want to pray for. And you get them to pray for themselves in Jesus' name. So it'd be like Jane if she had a poorly leg. And I say, "Why, well, Jane, why don't we going to pray for Jesus? And, um, and say, why don't you pray in Jesus' name, leg be healed? You would then say that. So in a way, you are now moving towards building up your own faith. And then you can pray afterwards. But to look out for things that may block faith final segment is about consecration and how we have to consecrate ourselves if we are to be effective. I 
And this is one that God has really kind of been speaking to me ever since I've been coming back from New Wine. Because consecration means make sacred and set aside for God. And that means things like time and energy. It can mean things like fasting. And these things, if we give ourselves, we spend time, again, uh, Lynn was talking about this last week, and I think every single time I've preached at Christ Church, it's about spending time with Jesus. That is our consecration. If we want to hear God, we need to do that. If we want God to be more effective in our lives, we need to do that. We can't just do it by turning up here once a week. That is a great thing. It is an act of worship. But if we really want to be effective and we want to hear God move in our lives and experience him, we need to do that. You know this. You're preached it every week, okay? We need to consecrate ourselves. It makes sense that if Jesus is the source of power, then we need to spend time with him to grow in his power. Okay, that is really quite heavy. Okay, we nearly finished. I'm kind of landing my sermon now. Okay, my bad bit. Okay, okay, well, um, that's quite heavy. I have, um, you'll be sent, the home group leaders will be sent the notes for all this. Um, there's some kind of, some questions that you'll have, which I know most of you will be, you use at home group. But there's some additional things like this, which, again, I made notes that Jordan's saying, join new wine. He talks about each of those sections, authority, gifting, faith, and consecration. And there's a number of verses there. You don't necessarily have to do that in your home group, but it may be something that you might want to do in your own time, in your consecrated time. Just as a kind of a final word, you know, I don't come here thinking, oh, actually, I can really, I'm really good at healing. I can't do this in my own strength. Um, This is something I'm kind of practicing and I'm trying. I'm trying to be kind of, trying to be effective, trying to be useful for God. I do believe in the um, power of supernatural ministries. I do believe it really exists. I have seen it with my own eyes. But we are all called to try it. Faith is spelled T-R-Y. That's his phrase. T-R-Y. That's what faith is spelled. So let's get out there. Start being a bit more weird. There will be some ministry at the end. I, I, I don't want people to Please do not leave this room if you have, if you need some prayer. At this point, Satan is now speaking to you. Dean is talking a lot of rubbish. Um, oh, I'm not that bad, really. Um, there are probably a number of little things that are coming in your head, little excuses that you want to take home with you, because actually they're very comfortable. Don't forget, some of those characters that Jesus healed and his disciples, he asked them, do you want to be healed? And some people say no to this. They don't want to be healed because it gives them, it's a crutch. It is a comfort thing. So I I just offer that up. Uh, If you want to receive prayer, there will be the ministry team later on. And we can pray a blessing or whatever. There's no kind of agenda as such. Come and join, join us at the end get some prayer. What, what better, better gift and experience can you have? 